Over the past couple of months, we've been in a series of lessons, Knowing God by Name. Can you imagine two people really getting to know and love each other without knowing each other's names? Somehow our name becomes so intertwined with who we are that it's difficult to imagine two people claiming to know and understand each other without knowing each other's names. And that's no less true in our relationship with God. The Bible is clear that God knows our names. Read Isaiah 43 and verse 1 out loud with me. Let's read this together. The Lord who created you says, Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Don't miss that God says to us, I have called you by name. The question is, do we call God by his name? ChristianAnswers.net tells us that there are some 950 different names and titles attributed to God in the Old and the New Testaments. (laughs) I suppose that any one of us could begin at Genesis and work our way through the 66 books of the Bible, through Revelation, and study each and every one of these names. But that's really not our purpose here in this series of lessons. Our purpose is knowing God by name, focusing on just a few of his more prominent names so that we can get to know him up close and personal, so that we can better understand who he is and what he does, so that we can address him by the appropriate name that best fits the moment, so that we can hallow his name in every way possible. And therefore, we've learned more about Adonai, the preeminent one, Elohim, the self-existent one, El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one, El Elyon, the superlative one, El Olam, the everlasting one, Yahweh, the personal one, and then last week, Yahweh with a blank after it, the descriptive one. And to this point, all of our lessons have been about the Old Testament, Hebrew names for God. But today's lesson, Abba, the fatherly one, will be about the most prominent New Testament name. For God. The Greek word is pater, and the Aramaic word is Abba. Both come from the Hebrew word, root word, Av, which simply is translated Father. Although God is called Father 15 times in the Old Testament, the name was used more in a national sense. God is the Father, and the nation of Israel is his son, or Child, Here's an example from Isaiah 63 and verse 16. Surely you are still our father, even if Abraham and Jacob would disown us, Lord, Yahweh, you would still be our father. Notice the references to our father. In other words, the Israel, the Jews, saw God as the father of their nation collectively, our father, not as the father of each individual person. In fact, Old Testament Jews considered God to be majestic and powerful, unapproachable, even distant. To Israel, God thundered from Mount Sinai. Exodus 20, verses 18 and 19 tells us, When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. You see, to Israel, God was the Holy One in the midst of the Shekinah glory, the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. He was the God who resided between the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant, which was within the Holy of Holies, a place that was off limits except for one day a year, the Day of Atonement, when the high priest would enter the most holy place. By contrast, in the New Testament, Jesus revealed a more approachable relational God. He himself called God Pater or Abba, Father, and he taught us to do the same. In fact, Jesus called God Father 221 times in the four Gospels. That's a lot. And the name was used in a more personal sense. God is the Father, and we individually are his children. And then this same name for God, Father, continues to be used throughout the balance of the New Testament. In fact, another 90 times. And it's found in every single book of the New Testament. It is undoubtedly the New Testament name for God. 
Now, let me say just a brief word about the Aramaic word for father, Abba. This term is always coupled with pater. So you have Abba ho pater in Greek, which just simply means Abba father in English. It's used only three times in the New Testament, but they are significant verses, and I want us to highlight them right here. In Mark chapter 14, verse 36, when Jesus was praying on the day of his crucifixion there in the Garden of Gethsemane, he cried out, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Paul, it tells us there that in this intense and and intimate moment, that Jesus chose to use this term of endearment, Abba, Father. In Romans 8, verse 15, the Apostle Paul reminds us, the spirit you received brought uh, about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Paul reminds us of our adoption to sonship. That's why and how we, through the Holy Spirit, can even approach God and address Him so personally and so intimately as our Abba Father. And then in Galatians 4, verses 4 through 6, the apostle writes, God sends His Son to redeem that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are His sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out Abba Father. And again, Paul reminds us of our adoption to sonship, which is why and how we, through the Holy Spirit, can even approach God and address Him so personally and intimately as Abba, Father. Now, some scholars will tell us that the name Abba was a colloquial term of familiarity that a young child would have used, similar to how American children would use the names Papa or Daddy. Other scholars consider this definition to be disrespectful of God's omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient nature. But whichever side of that you take, you favor, the fact is that the name Abba does suggest a God who is paternal, patriarchal, or familial. It's a, it's a picture of a nurturing father who is loving and caring for his children. Knowing God by name, Abba, the fatherly one. With that introduction as our foundation, then let's take a closer look at how the New Testament describes our Heavenly Father. This past week, as I was reading and studying through the 311 uses of the name Father in the New Testament, and yes, I did look up all 311. (laughs) There were several attributes of God's character and nature as Father that were repeated again and again. They stood out to me. And to help us remember them better, let's hang the six of them on the acrostic FATHER, F-A-T-H-E-R. The F would stand for family. When we say the name FATHER, the first picture that comes to mind, I think, for all of us is family. A father with his children gathered around him. Now, the New Testament uses two different word pictures to describe how we can become a child in God's family. The first word picture is that of being born again. Jesus himself paints this picture of being born again. A person who is living, you see, outside of the family of God is spiritually condemned, and unless he or she experiences a spiritual rebirth, he or she will spend eternity without God in hell. Here's how Jesus worded it. Let's read John 3 and verse 3 out loud together. Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Now, of course, being born again happens when an individual chooses to follow Christ as Savior and commits his or her life to Jesus as Lord. The second word picture that's used to describe how a person becomes a child of God is that of adoption. This is what the Apostle Paul talks about in Romans chapter 8 and Galatians 4 that we read just a moment ago. Ephesians 1 and verse 3 puts it this way. His, God's unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by sending Jesus Christ to die for us. Whereas born again may refer to the birthing of someone into God's family, the giving of new life. Adoption speaks more of the new relationship that we have with the Father and the legal rights and privileges that come with being a son or a daughter. 
Simply put, Jesus didn't die just to save us from eternity in hell, but also to give us a wonderful new status as children of God. Isn't that amazing? Family. The A would stand for access. Access. Paul reminds us in Ephesians 2 and verse 18, through him, through Jesus, we have access to the Father. Hebrews 4 verse 16 instructs us, let us then approach the throne of grace, that is God's throne, with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And when Jesus taught us to pray, he told us this then is how you should pray, our Father in heaven. Now please understand that what's taught in verses like these, direct accessibility to God, was a whole new concept to the early Jewish Christians. To approach God freely and openly as Father, as Abba, is a privilege that we enjoy because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. As Paul put it, through him we have access to God. The Father. When Jesus died, the veil in the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. A very visible picture to the Jews then and to us now that God is not unapproachable, but He is accessible. We can approach the throne of grace, God's throne, with confidence, as the writer of Hebrews tells us. We can address God as Father in heaven. Access. The T would stand for training. Quite frankly, training is a topic that most of us would rather not discuss. That's because we don't enjoy the pain that's usually associated with learning and maturing. In simple terms, we're talking here about God's discipline. The writer of Hebrews goes into great detail about it in Hebrews chapter 12. He writes, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. In short, training or discipline has two facets to it, preventive and corrective. Preventive and corrective. Now, preventive instructs us with principles so that we can stay on the right path. Corrective reproves us when we get off the path and puts us back on the right path once again. And whichever form of discipline, God's ultimate goal is to train us so that we can become more and more and more like his son. Jim Carpenter writes, Your heavenly Father never makes a mistake in discipline. His timing is perfect, his motives are pure, and his methods are never destructive. They are always beneficial. They always have this in purpose in mind, godliness, to help us become like Christ in our character and behavior. Training. Now the H would stand for simply help. <laughs> Ever said that word to God? Help! <laughs> because He is our Father, God is eager to come to our aid when we need Him. He's never an absent Father, aren't you glad? He's never too busy. Hey, come back and talk to me later about that. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells us, Do not worry, uh, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For your heavenly Father knows that you need them. And then in the very next chapter, Jesus continues, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts? <laughs> Amen. Because God our Father is omniscient, He knows everything, past, present, and future, He knows our every need before we even need it. 
And because He's omnipresent, that is, present everywhere all at once, He is always there for us just when we need Him the most. And because He is omnipotent, almighty, and all-powerful, He is able to provide anything and everything that we might need. Help. Now the E stands for endowment. Endowment. As a child of God, we have a promise of a future endowment, a glorious inheritance that is awaiting us. In the two verses immediately following Romans 8.15, the one of the Abba Father verses we read earlier, the Apostle Paul writes these words, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Likewise, Galatians 4 and verse 7, immediately after telling us about our adoption to sonship and how the Spirit in us calls out, Abba, Father, Paul tells us, and since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Hmm. Yeah, we're heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. Our pater, our Abba, has a future endowment, a glorious inheritance awaiting for us. Here's what Paul had to say about it in Ephesians 1, verses 17 and 18. And again, I'm going to ask you to read this one out loud with me. Let's read it together. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened and in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance. Yeah the hope to which he has called you. This glorious inheritance, this future endowment is promised to every heir, every child of God. Our hope comes from the promise of a heavenly home being prepared for us, that we will have, in fact, a new resurrection body that is free from pain and sorrow, yay, that we will be with Christ forever, that we will be reunited with our Christian loved ones, that we will receive an inheritance that is beyond our wildest imaginations. Endowment. The R then stands for responsibility. Now, being a child of God the Father has many benefits and privileges, all these things we've been talking about up to this point, family, access, training, help, endowment. But there's another aspect to our relationship with Pater and Abba that must also be addressed, and that is our responsibility as God's children. The Apostle Peter put it this way, 1 Peter 1, verses 14 through 17. As obedient children, let yourselves be pulled into a way of life shaped by God's life, a life energetic and blazing with holiness. God said, I am holy, you be holy. You call out to God for help and he helps. He's a good father that way. But don't forget, he's also a responsible father and won't let you get by with sloppy living. (laughs) And as a responsible father, God expects us to be responsible children. That means a life energetic and blazing with holiness. That means I'm holy, you be holy. That means he won't let you get by with any sloppy living. We're talking about responsibility. So here are several attributes of God's nature and character as a father that stand out to me as I worked my way through the New Testament this past week. Family, access, training, help, endowment, and responsibility. I hope that helps you understand your father a little bit better. And that's a look at the scripture this morning. Now, what lessons can we learn and apply to our daily lives from today's study of Pater or Abba? Earlier, I asked you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. If you were to ask me what New Testament passage best describes God the Father, Without hesitation, I would refer you to this story of the father and his prodigal son. Although we usually think of the prodigal son as being the main character of this story, I'd like to challenge you today to look at this story in a different way. I'd like to challenge you to look at it with the father as the main character. 
Here in this parable, we see the six attributes of God's character and nature that we've studied today. Family, access, training, help, endowment, and responsibility. You can look later and try to figure all that out, but they're all in there for sure. Now, I'm going to read this. I'm not going to comment a whole lot, but I am going to comment some. And I just want the story to kind of speak for itself. So please follow along with me in your Bible as I read. Luke chapter 15, we pick it up with verse 11. Jesus continued. Ah, I've got to stop already. <laughs> Jesus continued what? <laughs> well, see, there's three stories to this parable. The first story was the parable, the story of the lost sheep. This shepherd has a hundred sheep. He loses one of them. He leaves the 99, and he goes in search for the one who had wandered away and was lost. And he brings that sheep back, and he rejoices because he's found the lost sheep. The second story is about the parable of the lost coin. This widow has coins, and she loses one of them, and she turns her house inside out and upside down, hunting for this lost coin. She finds it. She's so happy she finds it. She even invites her neighbors to come and celebrate because this coin that was lost is found. And then it says in verse 11, Jesus continues. See, he's telling these stories about lost things being found. And he's going to tell the story now. It says, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. Now, i got to stop again for just a moment and say that is an absurd request. This doesn't happen in a Jewish household at this point in time in history. A younger son does not ask for his endowment, for his inheritance, prior to the death of his father. That was unheard of. In fact, it was disgraceful, and in fact, it was unlawful. So unlawful that this younger son who made this request should have been disciplined, and actually, in most Jewish households, would have been thrown out of the family and would not have been allowed to come back to the city or the town in which they lived. He would have been an outcast just because he made this request. But look what happens. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me the share of my estate. So he, the father, divided his property between them, between the younger son and the older son. Hmm. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, and he set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. And he had spent everything. There was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields, oh, no, to feed pigs. No good Jewish boy would ever do such a thing. So down in the pit was this young man that he was willing to set aside all that would be unclean and feed pigs. And notice what it says in verse 16, he longed to fill his stomach. He wanted to eat the pig slop. He wanted to fill his stomach with the pots that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came, verse 17, when he came to his senses, that's probably, by the way, the most important phrase in this entire story. Right there. When he came to his sentence. Aha! <laughs> Ding! Yeah. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Now, again, the very fact that he was even planning to come back and try to do this is totally crazy. The people listening to this story would have gone, no way, not going to happen. Father's going <laughs> to not even accept him, not even let him into the house, not even let him into the the city in which they live, this guy, he's gone. He doesn't even exist on the family name anymore. No, he's gone. Can't do it. So, verse 20 says, he got up and went to his father. But notice this. Here's where the father's the main character. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. Now, what's that tell you? That tells you the father was looking for him, doesn't it? 
That tells you the father has been scanning the horizon every day that this young man has been gone. Maybe today my son will come home. And he sees him. And he's filled with compassion, it says here in the verse, for him. He ran to his son. Oh, I've got to stop there too. That was something a father would never do. It was totally undignified for a father to run. This was the patriarch of the family. People run to him. He never runs. How disgraceful that he would run. But he ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said to him, here's the speech, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. That's all the further he got out. He didn't get the rest of it out. You notice that? But the father interrupts him and said to the servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger. In other words, he's back in the family 100%. And sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let Let's have a feast and celebrate. Celebration time. Come on. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, hmm, I hate to even have to read this, but the older son. Who's the older son, by the way? It's us. Yeah. Back... Back then it was the Jewish religious leaders. But right now, in this application of this to today, we're the older son. Not something to be proud of. The older son was in the field. He's doing his business. Me and he came near the house. He heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked, What's going on? Your brother's come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. And so his father, again, remember, the father's the main character. What did the father do? He went out and pleaded with him. And he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. <laughs> But when this son of yours... Notice how he says that. He doesn't say, when my brother. He says, when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had... Notice that. We had to celebrate and be glad because this... No, notice how the father turns around. This brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Oh my goodness, what a beautiful story. Now to help us understand this amazing story in a more contemporary context, let's watch this video together. You're not being you anymore. Yes, I am. What do you want from me? Do you want to take out my clothes again, Daddy? Are you trying to be someone you're not? This is my body, okay? If I want to dye my hair or put a ring to my nose, that's my boy. that led to desperation and mistakes and misplaced trust. Hey! Some of the pain was your own doing. Some of the pain um. was caused by others it's okay. who took advantage of you. Get whatever you want. I think I like the Just red. This was 
was not love. Nor was it your doing. What is that? And if you find yourself you rejected or lost, Let's go. Stop. know there is something better. Stop. Let go of me. When you feel alone, listen for my voice. You are not alone. Mom. Dad. I was wondering about maybe coming home. I'm catching a bus up your way, and it'll get there early tomorrow morning. If you're not there, th that's fine. I mean, I'll just stay on the bus, I guess. Come by fire, come by rain. Come by boat. Come by plane. You are all I can't replace. How I love to see you again. Just tell me I'll be seeing you again. You can never run too far, or shout too loud, or be gone so long that you can't find your way home. Just tell me I'll be seeing you again. come home. Pater is waiting. Abba is watching. Your father is longing to welcome you home with open arms, with unconditional love and forgiveness, with a robe and a ring and sandals, with words, let's have a feast and celebrate. So what are you waiting for? When will you come to your senses? If you're lost, if you've wandered, if you're a prodigal son or daughter, you can always come home right now, today, this very moment. We're going to sing a song in just a moment. I want this to be a time of commitment, a time when we say to God, Lord, I'm coming home. <laughs> Enough of this wandering stuff. Now, I don't know what coming home means for you today. For someone who's here listening to this, it might mean coming to Jesus for the very first time. You might need to come to Him as the Savior and the Lord of your life today. He's got His arms wide open, ready to receive you. For others of us, it may mean that we've been wandering a bit, and it's time for us to just 
come back and say, I'm tired of the pig pen. I, I, I want to come home, Father. I want to be your son again. I want to be your daughter again. For some of us, it may mean that there's a, a sin that we've been dealing with that's been just plaguing us and haunting our lives, and coming home might just sim- simply mean that we're going to say to God, God, I, I'm, I'm, I've had enough. That's no more of that. No more of that. I'm coming home. I'm coming home to you, Father, today. And I could go on and on. You understand what I'm saying. But I want us to stand right now. We're going to sing this song. If We're just going to open it up. If anybody wants to come for prayer and deal with anything in your relationship with God, now's the time to do it as we sing this song. You'll sing it with us. Just make a commitment right where you are, okay? I've wandered far away from God Now I'm coming home The paths of sin too long I've trod Lord, I'm coming home Coming Let's lift it up. I've wasted many precious years. Now I'm coming home. I now repent in bitter tears. Lord, I'm coming. Knowing God by name. This morning we've taken a closer look at the New Testament name for God, which is Father, Abba, Pater. Next Sunday we're going to wrap up this series by looking at the name I Am. Kind of go full circle kind of here. Uh, Jesus claimed to be God. Literally, his claim to be Yahweh. And we'll hopefully learn uh, what that means. Let's pray. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for um, allowing us to learn about you as Father today. And whatever else we've learned, I, I pray that in our being prone to wander, that we would always remember you can always come home. Thank you, Lord, for that. Just take us in your arms, Abba. Let us not only come into your presence, but just ah, 
no way, any way other to say it, but just hug us today. Just take us up in your arms and love us and reassure us. And just let us be your child. And would you please be our Father? We pray in Jesus' name.